but I just got wiped out. Yeah, that's right. Good morning. Welcome to Ambassadors Unplugged. Although I'm not sh they actually are plugged. We are all <laughs> up here. Uh, a hard look at the state of the world. I'm John Owen. I'm a senior fellow here at the Miller Center. I'm also chair of the Department of Politics at the university, and I'll be moderating this session. A hard look at the state of the world. Uh, that's a tall order. I guess we can be grateful that they didn't ask us to comment on what's going on in other planets. There are no astronomers up here. Um, what's happening in world politics on this planet is complex enough. And uh, much is happening that's perplexing and worrying. The world of uh, foreign policy and international relations, which I study for a living, is always complex. Um, one can always find crises or and even more potential crises uh, if one looks hard enough. Uh, but many think that the state of the world today really is unusually fraught. Um, many Americans have the sense as they look at China, at Russia, at the Middle East, even at Britain and Europe, to say nothing of uh, within their own country, uh, that the verse of William Butler Yeats from just over a century ago, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, uh, is once again true. Uh, our own country seems to be departing from its long traditions and practices toward allies, toward foreign peoples, seeking democracy and refuge. Um, how do we make sense of this? What is coming? Here to help us make sense of this turbulent world are two serious, accomplished people, public servants with great learning and years of experience in foreign policy. To my immediate left is Ambassador Nancy Soderberg. With over 30 years of experience in foreign policy, Ambassador Soderberg has served on four presidential campaigns in the United States Senate, in the White House, and at the United Nations. Uh, Ms. Soderbergh served as Foreign Policy Director for the Clinton-Gore 1992 campaign. In 97, President Clinton appointed her to serve as alternate representative to the UN as a presidential appointee with rank of ambassador. Uh, 1993 to 97, she served as a third ranking official at the National Security Council of the White House. Uh, since then, she's been Vice President of the International Crisis Group in New York president of Connect U.S. Fund in Washington, and today, Ambassador Soderberg is president and CEO of Soderberg Global Solutions, an international consulting firm. She's also distinguished visiting scholar, director of the Public Service Leadership Program at the University of North Florida in Jacksonville. She's author of two books and numerous articles. If she looks familiar, it's because she is on, uh, often on leading media outlets. She holds a bachelor's degree from Vanderbilt and a master's uh, from Georgetown. So welcome, Ambassador Soderbergh. Uh, to her left is Ambassador Eric Edelman. And Ambassador Edelman is the Ann C. Strickler Practitioner Senior Fellow here, here at the Miller Center. He served in senior positions at the Department of State and Defense, as well as at the White House, where he led organizations providing analysis, strategy, policy development, and many other areas. As Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in the George W. Bush administration, he was the Pentagon's senior policy official. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Finland in the Clinton administration and Turkey in the Bush administration. He was Vice President Cheney's Principal Deputy Assistant for National Security Affairs. Ambassador Edelman has been awarded the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Joint Distinguished Civilian Service Award, shall I go on? The Pre <laughs> Presidential Distinguished Please Service don't. Award. In 2010, he was named a Knight, I have to do this one, a Knight <laughs> of the French National Order of the Legion of Honor. <laughs> With a BA in History from Cornell and a PhD in History from Yale. Uh, welcome, Ambassador Edelman. Now, we have lots to cover. 
And uh, we're going to, I've warned uh, the, the ambassadors in advance, we're going to take a geographical approach at first, just sort of tour the world, and, and we may even have some visual aids. Uh, but I want to start with China, and I say that because every morning I turn the radio on on the way to work, or I log on to my trusty iPad, and there's something on, on China and coronavirus specifically. And that's not something political scientists normally talk about, but they are now, and they, they should. And I want to ask with, uh, let's see, last night there were more than 70,000 cases, more than 1,800 deaths. The thing hasn't peaked yet. This is mostly in China, but I wanted to get, uh, start with Ambassador Soderbergh. Um, how do you think the Chinese government's handling this? Um, might this affect Xi Jinping's domestic le legitimacy, his, his power? What's your read on that? Well, first of all, it's um, been mishandled by the Chinese. In 2003, they had the SARS virus and they tried to hide it. Um, and it blew out of proportion and thousands uh, were affected. And they seem to have done exactly the same thing here. Um, we've learned from the previous outbreaks that the first thing you do is sound a global warning, contain it where it comes, usually comes from animals. So if uh, the bird flu, for instance, came from, I think, chickens, and the farmers didn't want to kill their chickens unless they're going to be compensated. So there's, there are ways to actually move on quarantining and containing the problem. They just didn't do it. Um, and so it is a global crisis. Uh, it's already affected Americans, and I think it's going to get worse before it get better. So I don't know if anyone's planning to take cruises <laughs> through the, but the last place you want to quarantine people is on a cruise ship. I mean, it's a it's a incubator for that. So, in terms of how it affects China geopolitically, Apple has already said that its sales are not going to meet its uh, quarterly expected earnings. It is going to take a hit. I think the difference with um, the leadership in China, um, Xi Jinping doesn't have to ever stand for re-election. Right. And so as long as he maintains the, the party base, which I assume he will, he'll weather this storm. And I think um, the global markets seem to not really be dramatically reacting to mm -hmm. it. I think you'll see a little bump if it gets in infinitesimally worse, then, then yes, it'll take a global hit. But right now, the hope is that it's almost peaked and, and will um, will contain. There's also you know the Belt and Road Initiative that China's building. Um, for those of you who may not be in the weeds on this, it, they're building an incredible modern Silk Road by air and land to cover basically the entire continent. And along that road, the Chinese travel, and therefore it could easily yeah. spread much more quickly uh, than it might have a couple of decades ago. Yeah. On this Belt Road Initiative, uh, once called yeah, the New Silk Road, then One Belt, One Road, road. now just mm -hmm. Belt Road Initiative, whatever you call it, I want to ask Ambassador Edelman, it, is this for real? Because it, the figures you get from China, uh, the, the figure you get is one, it's a one trillion dollar investment project, infrastructure investment project. This, if that's true, it's in real dollars, constant dollars, seven times bigger than the Marshall Plan was after the Second World War. Um, Eric Edelman, is this, is this real? And if it's real, what does it mean? <coughs> Well, I think it's real, although I don't know that you ever should believe any numbers that come out of, of Beijing for a lot of the reasons Nancy was just talking about. Um, but it is real, and it's, um, in the comparison to the Marshall Plan, is an interesting one because it has a totally different purpose than the Marshall Plan. I and mean, the Marshall Plan was an effort to very briefly provide uh, liquidity that Europe needed in order to be able to complete its economic recovery from World War II. Right. Um, and restore uh, global trade patterns. Uh, the, the Belt Road Initiative is clearly an effort to increase uh, China's influence and um, uh, ability to exert power uh, around the world. Um, that being said, um, I think it actually provides a bit of a strategic opportunity for the United States mm -hmm. because I think it just reeks of, of what in a different context uh, Paul Kennedy might have called imperial overreach I think it, it is likely to, uh, first of all, it's, it's uh, built on developing a lot of the kinds of white elephant economic projects that are already saddling China with enormous amounts of uh, underperforming uh, and non-performing loans in its own banking system. Um, it's being done on 
uh, credit basis, and as Christine Lagarde has pointed out, uh, has the, uh, carries with it the danger of um, putting a lot of the countries who get these mm. deals with China into a debt trap down the road because it's not free money from from China. And uh, third, it is um, usually comes with uh, Chinese managers and Chinese workforce. There are now two million Chinese in Africa who are working on projects connected to uh, Belt and Road. Um, and uh, they're terribly unpopular where, wherever they go. And so I think uh, there's a potential strategic benefit. Moreover, to the degree that China is focused on um, Central Asia and um, uh, the landmass of Asia as opposed to the maritime domain, mm -hmm. which brings it into almost immediate conflict with us because we're you know, a, a Atlantic and a Pacific power and have been for a long time. Um, uh, Belt and Road is going to almost uh, certainly bring them into conflict with Russia, which from a strategic point of view, in a world where we're more and more worried about near-peer competitors like China and Russia is probably a good thing, too. <laughs> hmm. I, I think I would also just add to that, just uh, if you look at the map and look at the numbers, um, anyone know how many people are on Earth today? Just roughly. Seven and a half, almost eight. And we're 322 million. There's over, more than a billion Chinese, and there's two billion people more who are going to be on Earth by mid-century. We're going to peak at 10 billion, and then the development is going to mean that that probably is going to stop and start going down as populations stop having 10 kids. Um, but two billion more people, and a lot of them are going to be in Africa and Asia. So China has a resource gap. And over the last 30 years, I've seen this happen. I spent a lot of time in Africa, and I'd go into these various war zones with corrupt regimes, and there were Chinese businessmen everywhere. And I'd fly in these planes, and there are all these Chinese businessmen. They'd go in, they'd have a little shanty town right next to the built, and they would bribe the governments in exchange for a marble parliament or a soccer stadium and get a sweetheart deal on all the resources. And the corrupt governments would make millions, and the Chinese get their, um, their resources. Fast forward 10 years, they've got a whole network, essentially, to just pipeline the resources right to China. Um, they are building islands, militarizing islands in the South China Sea in international waters mm -hmm. to get the trillions of fisheries oil to control those paths. I think one of the strategic mistakes we've made in recent years is to pull out of the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership Agreement. Yes, it had problems. Go fix the problems. The whole deal was to contain China. It was, it, here on the East Coast, we don't think of the United States as a Pacific nation, but we are a huge Pacific nation. And all of the countries around China are begging for us to come and have strategic partnerships with them. So it was the United States and 11 nations around China precisely to try and push back on this trade. And I think we are missing a huge strategic opportunity. What's happened since we pulled out, China's starting to make deals because they're afraid. I was in Vietnam a few years ago, and the Chinese were visiting there. The, the Vietnamese hate the Chinese, but they're afraid of them, and they will deal with them as they need to. So I think we... These are um, close neighbors. They're, they're not moving. Right. Yeah. And uh, there's going to be confrontation there, and they're going to depend on us to try and help counterbalance that rising competition from China. Well, I, you remind me, I was in India a couple of years ago at a conference, and uh, this was at a think tank affiliated with the Ministry of Defense there. And there was a lot, of, a lot more worry about the Belt Road Initiative in India than I'd anticipated. Then I looked at a map and thought, of course, it's the Indian Ocean in this, Quite and right. India is not part of this thing. So... Um, for the United States, is this just something to sit back and watch, or do you, uh, Ambassador Soderberg, you're saying this is an opportunity, maybe a combination of threat and opportunity the United States needs to respond to and really um, make sure it's engaged in the region. Um, so, so, but some might say, let's just sit back and let this happen, let the Chinese waste their money, um, and so on. Why, why is that not the right policy? Well, I might... Um disagree slightly with Eric's assessment of how real this is. It's real, and the Chinese have the resources to build it, and the labor to build it, and the will to 
squeeze the population to get what it wants. They don't ever have to stand for elections. We do. <laughs> so our presidents are slightly um, uh, hampered from what they can do. But I think we're, we're missing the boat in, in withdrawing from, from the region. Now, the president has a trade war going on with China, um, which Americans average $600 a family um, are paying for. Uh, China's not paying for it, we are. Uh, trade wars never benefit anybody. Um, our farmers are eating $28 billion a year from it. Um, so I'd like to see a reset where we um, lower the rhetoric and the tariffs and start you know, trading together. You can negotiate a better deal if you want to, have better, tough, uh, tougher on the international property rights. They're manipulation of their currencies, um, all the kind of cheating that China does, uh, these trade wars aren't changing those behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, lower that rhetoric and then begin to see where we can work with China against Russia, which is a threat to both of us, um, but also to try and lower the rhetoric on some of their militarization of the region and their, their blatant, you know, fist flexing in, in the region. I, I think we ignore it at our peril. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, uh, we'll stay on China for a minute because it, it's so important. Um, the South China Sea, which one of you alluded to a moment ago, and let me throw in Taiwan with that. There are uh, some people who study the region say these are two potential flashpoints between the United States and, and China. Things are, can, are, are dangerous, and, and Ambassador Soderbergh already mentioned China is building military, building islands and then putting runways, and these are not for tourist sites uh, in the South China Sea. The, the United States Navy patrols the South China Sea to keep... They're putting anti-aircraft uh, weapons in the, on the islands as more well. To, more to the point. So, um, this is very troubling. Um, Ambassador Edelman, is there real trouble ahead? Or how, how will the United States manage this, do you, do you think? Well, I think it, it's true that both... Um, both Taiwan and the South China Sea are, are flashpoints. It's also true that uh, if we were to end up in a conflict with China um, in over either one of those, uh, although I think we probably today would be able to prevail, uh, in the long run, I think that's open to question if current trends mm. continue. Um, for my sins, the uh, Congress asked me to co-chair with Admiral Gary Ruffhead the National Defense Strategy Commission that reviewed the National Defense Strategy that Secretary Mattis announced mm -hmm. um, in January of 2018. And one of the findings of the commission was that um, we could lose a conflict over either one of these places um, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years uh, if things don't continue. I mean, China has been engaged in a uh, double-digit annual defense buildup for over 20 years. They've arrayed an enormous amount of uh, military uh, capability um, opposite both Taiwan and in the South China Sea. The island building campaign um, that began really in 2010 um, is one part of that, but it's only one part of it. Um, and we really, I think, have to take, take this very seriously. I mean, China is both a potential military challenge for us, but it's also um, a very serious economic challenge for all the reasons uh, Nancy was talking about and the kind of predatory um, economic behavior it's been engaged in for a very long time. I agree with Nancy that trade war is not the right way to, to deal with this, but I do think we have to deal with the fact, and you know, Nancy and I both served in the Clinton administration in which we brought China into the WTO. We did that, if you read, President Clinton's statement at the time under a certain set of assumptions of how China was going to behave. And those assumptions basically were assumptions similar to what my colleague in the Bush administration, Bob Zellick, articulated in, in uh, 2005, which is that China would become a responsible stakeholder in the international system, would abide by the rules of the WTO, and they haven't done that. So we've got to recalibrate, I think, both the economic and the military dimension of this competition. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to think about this as a, you know, another Cold War with the Soviet Union. It's very different. It's actually more complicated, I think, and more difficult than, than that. Well, I think we'll talk about this at the end, but I, um, 
have been in foreign policy for a long time, and it's really easy to get really depressed because it's such a mess. <laughs> um, but if you break it down, and I, I think ultimately uh, the world swings crazy right, crazy left, but in the end it settles in the middle, always. And I think whether a Democrat or Republican wins, it's easier if a Democrat wins in November. Um, I think you have to look at how can you reset this relationship with China and take advantage of some of this chaos to force changes. I would like to see the WTO get tougher on China and have the rest of the, it shouldn't just be the United States. There's all these bricks and mints, the developing countries who are major players now. Look, can we recreate a dynamic that isn't just us versus China or just Russia against China, but the responsible global actors um, working together to sort of take advantage of this moment of chaos. I mean, we really haven't redone the institutions of um, the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO since the 60s. And it's time to have that kind of reset. And we'll maybe close on those notes yeah. further. But I think for China, we have to take it. And nothing's going to change between now and November. But then look at, all right, how can we take advantage of this to avoid the downsides that it, that Eric's talking about and sort of force China to behave more responsibly and make it not, it's not a zero sum game with these countries. All boats can rise if we pull it right. John, could I just, Please. I just wanted to um, get back to the question you raised that Nancy addressed, I think, in part, which was how to deal with the BRI. Yeah. Um, no road initiative, yeah. And I think, you know, I think it means you have to have, a, you know, an active diplomatic effort. It's not just going on in, um, you know, in the Indian Ocean area or Africa or Central Asia. I mean, you see China buying up the port of Piraeus in Greece, mm -hmm. so it's, it's actually extending into, you know, the heart of our own, uh, one of our own major alliances. And so I think we have to be very active and alert and engaged. That requires a State Department platform, among other things, that's capable of executing, a, you know, a very uh, aggressive diplomatic effort. Um, we don't have that right now for a variety of reasons we can discuss if, if you care to. But just pause on that statement for a minute. We don't have a State Department. Why? <laughs> well, we can you know, talk about I think about it's that. a moment. You know, that's quite a dramatic statement. Well, do you a, disagree? Not at all. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> but I, you, I mean, that's a like headline, we do not have a State Department right now. And that's a not problem. Not a functional <laughs> one. But, and but, I think we all need to be alarmed at that. That's, that's not okay. But um, the other element here is... You know, the BRI is partly infrastructure and building and um, all of that, but it's also about influence. And uh, China's efforts at developing, you know, political influence efforts um, and uh, what I would call political warfare are on a par with Russia's. They're different in some ways, but they're similar in others. And we are very focused in this country for understandable reasons, given what happened in 2016, on you know, Russian interference in our elections in 2016, 18, ongoing in 2020, that's all legitimate. But if we were having this discussion in New Zealand or in Australia, mm -hmm. it would all be about China. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to think about how we combat uh, these political warfare efforts. Uh, we used to know how to do that, but we've, again, we've disassembled a lot of the um, uh, institutional infrastructure that we used to have to do that. The, U.S. Information Agency being one part of it, but not the only part. Um, and I think one of the ways to go after, for instance, the Chinese on uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is precisely one of the things Nancy highlighted, which is the corruption that they're essentially exporting mm. um, in, into um, Africa, to uh, you know, South Asia, Central Asia, elsewhere. Um, but you have to have the instruments uh, to do that, and right now we lack mm. them. I would encourage all of you when you go home uh, to pull up a map of the Belt and Road Initiative and see where it is. It is everywhere. It's, it's extraordinary. Yeah. And also, to Eric's point on the State Department, the Pentagon's budget, depending on how you count it, is about $750 billion a year. Anybody know what the State Department's budget is? Like, no, I think it's more like 40 billion? Yes. Um, 38 to 40. You know, what, what, why? You know, it's, um, so I, th I think we're just off kilter on a lot of things. Mm. But do, I'm a big map person, and yeah. 
go look at the map of what China is doing. It is extraordinary. And take a look there, these incredible satellites of the militarization of the South China Sea in the before and after pictures. Go home and Google it. It's unbelievably stunning what's happening. You can also find on YouTube um, uh, promotional videos about the Belt Road Initiative made by the Chinese government that are quite, quite <laughs> They're interesting. They're good, yeah. It's kind of cute. Um, Let's keep that map in your minds, but let's look a bit north. Let's look at Russia for a minute, uh, which uh, has already been mentioned. Has fallen out of the American headlines, but one question a lot of people have is, is Vladimir Putin going to be president for life? If so, what does that mean? I mean, do we just write Russia off as a partner in a cooperative country for the long term at this point? Which of you, um, Nancy? Do you want to go first? Uh, um, yes. Okay. <laughs> so much for Russia. Uh, no, Vla <laughs> Vladimir Putin is, is going to be um, uh, running the show, I think, most likely uh, um, until he dies. And I think, uh, you know, he's been trying to figure out if he could find someone to play the role that he played for Yeltsin and the Yeltsin family, that is to be a safe pair of hands that one could turn the government over to with a guarantee that that whatever corruption one had been involved in wouldn't be prosecuted. And that was mostly not Yeltsin personally, but his daughter, son-in-law, and others in the so-called yeah. family. Um, but Putin hasn't found a pair of hands yet that he feels he can entrust that to. Um, there's already a constitutional discussion in Russia going on about what mechanisms might be found to get around the two-term uh, you know, um, limit on the presidency of Russia. It's kind of um, interesting that Putin feels that he at least has to come up with something, you know, as opposed to just, you know, um, you know, you know, getting around the Constitution, you know, somehow otherwise. But uh, one option, obviously, would be to uh, forge a union with Belarus, which has been on the table for some number of years, and and would allow Putin to become the president of a. Russian, Belarusian Union, and then sit on top of whoever, you know, succeeds him as president of Russia. Um, my favorite is um, a, in a discussion that's been happening in, in Moscow in the last couple of weeks is a suggestion that he just be declared um, the, uh, you know, supreme ruler of Russia. The czar. Which, which is, yeah, that, that, there is a word in Russian for that, which I'm not sure why they don't just use. But I think, look, does it mean that uh, we're not going to be able to do anything with Russia around the world? Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, they still have uh, interests in common with us over a variety of issues, right. should they choose to pursue them. Right. And I would stress that Putin has chosen not to pursue issues of commonality with us. Mm -hmm. uh, one might be, you know, in the area of obviously strategic arms control, where we have the New START Treaty about to... Um, expire in 2021, and so there's a question about its renewal or not. I have my own views about that, which we can talk about. But, um, but obviously that's one issue where we could uh, work together, and it's one we worked on together um, uh, during the height of the Cold War, so there's no reason why I don't see why we can't do that now, particularly because Russia is developing a whole series of very dangerous uh, nuclear weapons that we ought to, ought to be giving us some pause. Right. I agree that he is there as long as he wants to be, and he, I think, is afraid to leave because of the corruption issues, but he also just surely likes power. Mm -hmm. um, his goal is to recreate um, the former Soviet Union as a regional empire. I don't think he's got global ambitious, but he considers any of the former Soviet Union countries, all 16 of them, um, fair game. He's invaded. Uh, two of them, Georgia, which no one ever talks about, and uh, Ukraine taking back their Crimea, and um, openly meddles in all the other countries, um, doing some of the same things he's doing here in the United States, which is, you know, bots on the political, uh, you know, lies, fake things to try and have the outcome. Um, and when, he, when his crony lost the election in Ukraine, that's when he decided to go in and keep them from tilting towards Europe. And that was really the, um, the trigger for him invading uh, Ukraine and trying to control the narrative there. Um, I find what he's doing 
extraordinary in the United States, um, bold, corrupt, um, and I do not understand um, why President Trump enables that and mimics it and doesn't stand up to it and sides with Russia um, meddling in this election, uh, Russians' narrative that it was Ukraine, which is completely false. Um, and I get that, oh, if he admits that they meddled in his election, it makes his, his election illegitimate. No, it doesn't. It's just a threat that we need to, <laughs> he got fairly elected. And um, it's a threat that we need to confront. And the only way you're going to confront it is to confront Putin and more sanctions and things. So there's just a disconnect there. But what, what the, the Russians are doing is very dangerous in terms of undermining democracy in that area and, out, and elsewhere. And if you look at um, the rise of authoritarianism, you know, at, at the end of the Cold War, democracy won, history was over, um, yay, democracy, boo, all the isms. All of a sudden, authoritarianism is back in real time. So only, um, anybody know how many countries, what percent of the countries are considered democratic today? 193 countries, 194 if you count, a couple other ones. Um, it's, it's, what? It's about half, which means the other half are free, you know, fair game for meddling and things like that. And the, the half is dwindling. Um, the trend lines are in the wrong direction. This is 2021. What? <laughs> We're in the 21st century. And, um, you know, it's extraordinary that we missed this over the last 30 years. We got complacent. Oh, Russia's going to be fine. We were both in office when Paul, President um, Yeltsin was going to be a democ democratic leader. President Clinton loved him. They had a real rapport. We thought things were going to be great, arms control, all that. And all of that's over now. This is not um, someone who we can trust or work with. Um, I would love, Eric's had some really, I, mean, I would, um, direct you to some of his writings on this, which I think are very interesting on what to do with the uh, nuclear arms control. Um, we are never going to use a nuclear weapon again. Uh, why are we expanding that arsenal and making it more dangerous for terrorists to get a hold of the fissile material, the plutonium and uranium that is used to make a nuclear weapon? The more of this stuff that's out there, and the, the primary proponent of this is conservative Henry Kissinger, who came out with this in 2007, saying, let's just ramp this down. Um, and so it's critical that we renew START. President Trump has said we're not going to. Um, and then there's all these weapons that are not even addressed in the strategic arms control. There's um, tactical nuclear weapons and all sorts of new ones that are incredibly dangerous. I don't put it past the Chinese to use one, I mean, by the, to the Russians to use one. I don't think the Chinese are actively contemplating it, but the Russians could be. Um, so there's all sorts of dangers that we absolutely have to, um, have to get to. And, and in terms of um, the relationship between um, Putin and Trump, it is, I think, goes back to his real estate deals and the Russian oligarchs that he's mm -hmm. been dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I think when the whole story is written about the Trump organization, it's going to be shown to have had um, Russian dirty money laundered through Deutsche Bank through his businesses. And that's also partly why it's it's kind of a disconnect there. And I, you know, the, the difference between a Trump organization and the US government is you can't keep secrets in the US government. There's too many public servants who, in my view, have been public heroes standing up to the truth. Um, and you can't hide, it eventually will come out. And so I think the president would be well um, advised to stop trying to skew the truth and just deal with these threats that are, are real and in our interest. I, you know, I wish the problem, <clears throat> Nancy, were just limited to President Trump. I mean, one of the things I find, or trends I find very worrisome, <clears throat> is the renorming, according to poll data, of self-identified Republican voters with his rather benign view of, of Putin. I mean, I think you and I both agree that, you know, Putin and Russia are a major challenge for the United States. Um, but now about 31, 32 percent of Republican voters argue that it's, you know, a partner, a fit partner for the United States. And that, that's purely the party, the, the top, party renormating re around top. Trump. It yeah. stems from the top. No, of course. And I think what's happened to the Republican Party is a whole other uh, Miller Center discussion. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's, I mean, I 
we, we both have uh, grown up in an era where bipartisanship was real. I started my career working for Ted Kennedy, who's as liberal as they get, but he said every bill that I introduce has to have Republicans on it or it won't last. Mm -hmm. Compromise was no, not a dirty word, and I think we need to get back uh, to that. Um, I and agree. I think there's some soul searching um, that probably won't start till after November, depending on how that comes out. But um, no, we're, we're only tackling easy <laughs> problems today, like China, <laughs> China and Russia. Uh, I and promise we'll leave you on an upbeat note yeah, at the yeah. end of this. But well, let's 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 look at another easy part of the. Let's look at the Middle East for a few minutes. Um, <laughs> President Trump ha has signaled maybe erratically, but has said repeatedly, and, and before he was president he was saying this, the United States is tired of these wars in the region, this is not, these, were, these are big mistakes, we're leaving. Um, what's the impact, and in fact there, has, there was this abrupt Twitter announcement about um, Syria, what, what's, what's the, how is this being received in the region, and what, what does that portend for the future of the stability in the region? Turkey, yeah, we'll, we'll turn to Ambassador Edelman first on this one. <clears throat> well, I think, you know, as in many other parts of the world, but particularly in the Middle East, the um, president's uh, tweeting and um, imp impulsive uh, policy decisions, I think, have created a great deal of uncertainty, and uh, particularly uncertainty about whether uh, the countries with whom we've been connected, and we don't, you know, we don't have formal alliances in the Middle East, we have a whole series of special relationships with with Israel, with the kingdom, many of them going back many years, with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, going back to Franklin Roosevelt, uh, with Egypt, uh, going back to the Nixon administration. And um, I think many of those you know, partners in the region are worried about whether, you know, in extremis, whether the U.S. will show up to help them. Uh, and that's been, I think, underscored by the failure to respond to certain Iranian behavior, the uh, disruption of shipping in the Gulf, the attack on Abcake in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which took 5% of the world's oil offline. Mm -hmm. Stunning, yeah. I mean, and to which the United States didn't respond at all. Uh, the shoot down of the, of the unarmed UAV uh, by Iran. Now, to some degree, the president's ordering the strike on Ghassan Soleimani has, I think, put the Iranians back a little bit on their back heel a little bit because I think they haven't, I think they didn't count on that and I think they're now trying to recalibrate and figure out what, what they should do and I think their inclination is to wait until November and see what happens uh, then. But I think, you know, you've got a very, very, uh, a region in a great deal of turmoil and you're going to have the actors in the region <coughs> doing, um, and it's not just, by the way, Trump. I mean, I think you know, President Obama also made it very clear he thought the United States was overinvested in the Middle East, wanted to draw down our involvement uh, if he could. I mean, if you read his interviews with Jeffrey Goldberg, that's very, very clear. Yep. So for actors in the Middle East, it's been, you know, uh, about a 10-year period in which they were dealing with a, a U.S. that they believe may be heading for the exits. The result of that is that people are going to take you know, matters, in, you know, security matters into their own hands. And I think very predictably they're going to do things we don't like or don't think are smart, um, you know, to wit the war in Yemen and the way the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the UAE have pursued that. Um, you know, and now, what's the fix for that? I mean, th the fix for that, in my view, is to recognize that as much as we would like to leave the Middle East, it's going to be very difficult for us to do that. Um, and that's because a lot of what goes on in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. And in the United States, at least, the political penalty for not paying attention, uh, you know, could potentially be another mass casualty attack on, on the homeland. And when that happens, you know, you'll see a, a very strong reaction, I think, from the American public again, uh, and the U.S. probably going back in in, you know, in even more costly uh, ways. Mm -hmm. So. You know, I think we have to just accept the fact that um, without the United States there, things in the Middle East are actually going to be worse, uh, not, not better. So on that, uh, either of you, uh, um, if we look a little bit to the east, we see Afghanistan. You, the United States is negotiating with the Taliban. Um, uh, this is America's longest war. Is it about to end? Is this a good idea to negotiate with the Taliban? Is this 
like negotiations with the North Vietnamese that led to the US, U.S. to leave in 1973, wherein we know what's going to happen, we just want a graceful exit, or, or is there some potential for stability in the region that, that of, of the sort that's in our interest? I'm just wondering. We don't know, but I, I just wonder what either we, of you think about to, this. We have to negotiate with the Taliban. And I remember being on the South Lawn when Yitzhak Rabin came to shake the hand of Yasser Arafat, and you could see him physically grimacing. And it took President Clinton to push them together. <laughs> and he was um, a man of great wisdom, and um, he said, um, you don't make peace with your friends, make them with your enemies. And that cost him his life. A right-wing Jew assassinated him uh, shortly thereafter. Um, there was supposed to be a deal with the Taliban um, last year, and it was pretty much teed up when I talked to the negotiators who were involved in it. Um, it was pretty much a done deal, and then Trump decided to turn it into a show and bring it to Camp David on the anniversary of 9-11. Uh, that blew up and it all fell apart some time. As long as the president stays out of it, it probably will occur. Um, and it's a reflection of the reality of uh, our failed policies in Afghanistan, um, partly because we blew it by pulling out of Afghanistan in, in an unnecessary war in Iraq and lost the ball. Had we stayed in Afghanistan and done the development and tried to just focus on that, I think we would have been able to declare victory and leave sooner. Um, you know, the history of Afghanistan as one empire after another has gotten stuck there for generations. And I do think it's time that we turned it into a big martial development plan and less of a military. And the only way you can do that is to deal with the Taliban. But it is not impossible that the Taliban could get elected fairly and democratically in Afghanistan. It's the same reason that the communists became popular again after Yeltsin, because people just want stability. They want to know what the rules are. And under the Taliban, at least you know what the rules are, as horrible as they are. Now, I don't think you're going to go back to the Taliban rule where women can't get elect, um, educated and can't work and the draconian nature is there. But um, we cannot be proud of our accomplishments there, unfortunately. Uh, and on the Middle East, I, I promised I'd leave you on an upbeat. No, I'm not going to be in the Middle East. Um, I am not. <laughs> it's still up time. I am not the least bit optimistic about. I think we've gotten it wrong in the Middle East repeatedly, and we are worse off now than we were 20 years ago. Um, and it's going to get worse. Um, and I would put this on Obama too. Uh, we do not have a policy in Syria. We never have had. Obama's policy was to overthrow Assad with no plan to do so, and defeat ISIS, and. You can't do both. So what we've done, in, in, uh, and then abandoning the Kurds is one of the most reprehensible decisions that this administration has made. I've worked very closely with the Kurds. I, can, I still, to this day, cannot believe we threw them under the bus. Um, and we're going to live to regret that day. So what we've done in Syria is handed over to the Russians and the Iranians. They're totally in control. Assad's not going anywhere. Terrorism's going to be up on the rise. We are in a war w in Yemen for reasons that I frankly don't understand. Um, it's a, a proxy war between the Iranians and the Saudis, and so we've taken the Saudi side. It's the worst humanitarian disaster in human history. It is awful what's happening there. Um, pay attention to it because it is going to come home to bite us. And no matter what we do with the Saudis, the Iranians will just increase their involvement. So I personally think we need to reset Yemen. I think maybe go back to a North and South Yemen, which was the way it was until recently when they tried to unite it, it's not working. But the whole relationship with the Middle East was built uh, for decades on a deal with the Saudis that they would give us cheap oil in exchange for us staying out of their internal affairs. And that deal blew up on 9-11. It's not an accident that 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudis. Um, but we don't really need that oil anymore. And why are we staying so close to a regime that literally dismembered a Washington Post journalist and its consulate in Turkey with no retribution whatsoever? No, I mean, it's just wrong. And so I think we have to rethink our policies there. The Arab Spring we thought was going to solve all the problems. It made them worse. And the Iranian 
issue is one that we're just going to have to deal with. Um, I think at some point we need to just reset those relationships. Um, pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal, I think, was a mistake. It at least contained the nuclear problem. No, it didn't get up to the ballistic missiles, the terrorism, the human rights abuse, the meddling in Iraq. All those problems still exist, but they're worse now that Iran is back on the path to getting a nuclear weapon. So I, I just think all of these issues are festering, and as Eric said, are putting us, we're the ones with the target on our backs in this area. And then lastly, the, the policy towards Israel, I think, um, I don't know what's going to happen to the administration of Bibi Netanyahu. He's in his, what, third or fourth term now, um, and facing another election and uh, indictment. jail term. And, and indictment for corruption. Um, so his only hope of staying out of jail, I think, is getting reelected. Right. Um, but that, even that might not work. Um, but what you have is a real dilemma in Israel now, because the two-state solution is, um, <coughs> I think, at risk of being off the table. Um, and you can go through the history of it, but Israel has a decision to make. If it doesn't want a two-state solution, it basically wants to annex the Palestinian territory, um, it will have an Arab majority state, partly Christian, partly Muslim, but it won't be a Jewish state unless you have an apartheid system, which is anathema, I think, to um, the essence of what Israel wants to be. And I don't know where it's going to end. I think this administration isn't a serious player in the region. Uh, it's just taking the Israeli government plan and putting it into their own words. And the Palestinians are not going to deal with this administration. There's no hope in getting anything moving under this. So I, I think it's the most dangerous part of the world for us right now. Um, technically, our major threat is the cyber threat, but this is right there. And there's going to be this is not going to smooth out anytime soon without a serious reset. And I don't have the answer to that, but I, I, I worry about it on every level. Let me just, a, a couple of points yeah. <clears throat> on what Nancy said. I, I'm not sure I share her relatively, and I'm stressing the word relatively, sanguine view of w where this is going in Afghanistan. Um, first, I think m uh, my former colleague, Zal Khalizad, has got uh, you know, an awful job trying to negotiate this with the president undercutting him uh, at every turn by basically stressing how much he, he wants to get us out of these, you know, these endless wars. Um, I think that's made Zal's job that much harder. I mean, in order for this to work, uh, the Taliban is going to have to do things it has never been willing to do or agreed to do before. And one has to suspend willingly disbelief that once we're gone, and they don't have to worry about U.S. forces anymore, that whatever they agree to do, they will continue to do. Um, and I, I just don't see anything in the past that would justify that, that kind of confidence. I, I also would take issue with the idea that, uh, you know, A, we can't be proud of some of the things we have accomplished uh, in, in Afghanistan. I mean, getting... Um, getting schools reopened, getting women back to school after almost 20 year hiatus, I think was an enormous accomplishment. And I also think, frankly, um, that uh, the idea that we could have done uh, much more in terms of rebuilding Afghanistan, based on my experience between 2005 and 2009, is probably uh, expecting us to do more than any, and I'm not talking about you know partisan way about administrations, but about the U.S. government uh, being able to do. I mean, Afghanistan is, you know, um, one of the five poorest countries in the world. It had uh, very, very limited human capital because for 20 years nobody went to school. I mean, and the country was torn apart, uh, first by the Soviets and then by a very brutal civil war. Um, it's, you know, if you look at its per capita income, it's basically at the same level as Haiti. Um, and if you think about our record on Haiti and what we've done in terms of rebuilding Haiti and then expect us to do better in a country that's 6,000 miles away, um, I, I just don't think I, that's I, realistic. I, I stand corrected on not appreciating those, and I've, both of us have friends that have worked there. We have done um, enormous in terms of the basic rights of women and development. I, how much did we spend in Iraq? Three trillion, twenty-one trillion. I can't remember. Yeah, it's not that much, but yes, it's, it's a lot. It's trillions, and um, also the attention of the senior officials was diverted. So I, 
I think we could have done better if we hadn't gotten um, diverted. And um, I'm not sure that um, I, I'm not sure that we know what to do in Afghanistan. Yeah, no, I, that, I mean, I think that's the right outcome. I have some questions about Europe, about NATO, Huawei, but I, in the interest of time, let me, let me set those aside. Maybe some of you, will, we will take your questions in a minute. Let's zoom out a little bit and just look at the globe, if you will. And I want to ask you about, let's see, Robert Kagan has a book, The Jungle Grows Back. So what he means is, um, if you don't tend the garden, the mother nature is going to come back. And, and uh, he and other people see this happening in the world now. Uh, the metaphor really has to do with international order, what some have called the liberal international order that the United States built and underwrote for decades after the Second World War. Um, that's being threatened in a number of ways from outside and, and from inside, from a loss of confidence uh, from within the United States and the rest of the West as well. So um, our fears of the collapse of this liberal international order overblown is the order, should, should we welcome the end of the order? Maybe there's something better we can achieve? An uh, open-ended question, but I w really wonder what you think about that, Nancy Silver. Um, I think um, the liberal international order is not about to collapse. Um, but it's hurting. And I think it's for a variety of reasons. Um, as I said earlier, half the world's not democratic, and that number is growing. And the authoritarianism that's on the rise in Russia, in the Philippines, in Hungary, uh, the rise of neo-Nazi groups, the uh, hate, it is fomented in some way because uh, the expectations of democracy were not met. Um, the Middle East has prompted the biggest refugee flow um, in history. <coughs> so you've got Syria sent out five million refugees who want to go to Europe. So you have this backlash against immigration in Europe and of course here. Um, and the questions of the values that I think most of us who come to a talk like this would, would share our empathy and values. And, um, you know, it's not like we don't have a role in Syria and Iraq and those refugees. Um, our immigrant ban today would not have let um, a guy named Jandali, who was a Syrian uh, migrant who came here to study. And his son ended up founding Apple. And today, if we hadn't let Jandali into this country, we never would have had Apple because there's no way that had he been stuck in Syria or were studying in Beirut that he could have founded Apple. It had to take Silicon Valley with the access to that. And the Fortune 500 companies, 40% of the Fortune 500 companies are founded by immigrants or the first generation. We need immigrants. We're 322 million. We'd be shrinking as a society if we didn't let them in. And yet all of this is under question right mm -hmm. now in a way that challenges our, our main assumptions. And I think we need to rethink what, who are we as a nation? What are we going to stand up for? And who are we going to try and um, recreate? And what that means is, I think, expanding the international order to give a seat at the table for those who have risen in the last 30 years, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, the BRICS, the Mexico, Indonesia, Ni was it Nigeria and Turkey, on the mints, the, the middle countries who are coming up now and want a seat at the table. Um, we shouldn't be using the G7, the G8. We should be using the G20, just it, which is the global South plus the Europeans and the U.S. and Canada, writing the rules. Let's expand the U.N. Security Council. Why does it still look like the 1960s? We've got five permanent members, the U.K., France, Russia, China, and us, running the world. Why, why is that fair? And so it fuels this resentment. And so I think we should take this moment to... Uh, look at the better angels of our nature and say, who are we as a people? And let's uh, listen to some of the frustrations and address them. Mm -hmm. These are all problems solved by men and can be solved by men and women. Um, and let's have that conversation. And I think that the, the Trump administration has turned a lot of things up on our head, but when things are scrambled up, you can, you know, 
make some lemonade out of these lemons and change what we're doing and use it as a reset. And I think that's the conversation. This is my optimistic note. Um, <laughs> that's the conversation that people want to have. And I think that no matter what happens in November, we will start having that. And it'll be a global conversation of, OK, let's have a reset here. The, the world needs to have a reset. And it's so broken on many levels right now that I think that sometimes you need a broken world to have the new ideas to fix it. And I would just say one thing, and then I'll stop talking. I've been teaching at a small state school in um, Jacksonville, Florida, for a while. and. The kids get it, uh, and talking to students here, they get it. They don't question climate change. They're not racist. They don't care whether you're gay, trans. I think it's partly because their phones are how they have their relationship. You can't tell what someone looks like when you're tweeting or whatever they do. Um, but they understand the need to be global citizens. They're connected with the world. Um, some of them can't find Canada on a map, I will admit, but um, <laughs> for the most part, they get it. And I think a school like um, you know University of Virginia and you know the the education system that we have is required to instill in the next generation a sense of responsibility for leaving the world a better place. We. And I, t I apologize to my students and say, sorry, we kind of missed the climate change thing. And you guys are going to have to double down and fix that. And I think they will. This next generation understands diversity, inclusiveness, getting your handle on the global challenges. And they have empathy. And so I'm optimistic that they'll use these. They know what's wrong in the world right now. And they're adamant about fixing it. And there's a passion there that I've, I haven't seen since the 60s. And I think it's about time. So disruption is uh, an opportunity for reform. What do you un say? Un un unlike Nancy, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not willing to promise you that we're going to leave you on an uplifting, you know, positive, <laughs> oh, optimistic, I should've, should've optimistic asked you note. First. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I wish I could get myself there. Um, the democratic recession, which is what uh, political, academic political scientists call right. what Nancy was describing, uh, is a very real phenomenon. Now, the backsliding among countries, uh, taking them out of the uh, column of democratic countries, according to Freedom House's annual reports, has um, gotten worse and worse over the last several years. Moreover, I wish I could share, <coughs> even though I teach you know, lovely, wonderful students as well, I wish I could share Nancy's optimism about the coming generation. I mean, a lot of the polling data globally about what young people value does not suggest that they put a high premium on democracy, on, uh, on uh, First Amendment rights and free speech, et cetera. On the contrary, those issues are very much now contested. Um, the liberal order, I think, is under, not, I mean, it's under very, very serious stress. And, and I may be a little bit less optimistic about Nancy about its resilience. Um, I, I tend to agree with Bob Kagan about the jungle uh, growing back. Basically, there are several very large-scale global phenomena that I think are creating this. One is the unequal distribution of the very real economic gains that have been achieved by globalization. I just in reading the Washington Post this morning before uh, coming down, I, I noticed that the UN has just issued another report about the role of economic inequality and in, uh, spurring some of the populism that we've seen. But it's not the only cause. In fact, it may not even be the most important. I mean, as Nancy said, migration and the cultural challenges that migration represent clearly has been another, and I would add yet a third, which has been the global increase of uh, women in the workforce, uh, which is not just a phenomenon in the United States. It's a global phenomenon, and which has led to what my wife sometimes calls testosterone poisoning um, <laughs> you know, among a certain uh, category of the population <coughs> that makes it very... Uh, open to these kinds of populist, nationalist um, uh, appeals. And I think, you know, we have to go back to the origin of when we set up this liberal international order after World War II to try and remember what it was established to accomplish. I mean, it was established in the wake of the most devastating war in human history that had been created by beggar thy neighbor economic policies between the wars, the rise of uh, exclusive nationalist regimes, 
um, that uh, created both turmoil in East Asia and, and in Europe. Now, one of the things that we you know, tried to do was create a, a circumstance in, in which we would have stability in Europe and, st and stability in Asia. And this was in a context when the um, biggest challenge to democracy had been from the right and had been defeated. And we then faced a challenge from the left. And for most of us who've grown up in that system, that's where the challenge has been. And we're not used to having to face the biggest challenge, particularly those of us on the center-right side of the political divide, coming from the right. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face now. One of the things that allowed us to be successful in winning the Cold War and keeping the liberal order going was the role of liberal anti-communism in ruling certain kinds of uh, you know, political movements beyond the pale. Essentially, communist movements controlled by Moscow or Beijing were beyond the pale. Uh, we haven't done that on the center right now about you know, what is beyond the pale, and we have to do that if we're going to get through this, this period. I don't mean to suggest that nobody cares about democracy anymore. That's not true. You could just look around the world and see what's going on in Hong Kong, the protests over the stolen Moscow municipal election, uh, what's happened in Sudan. There's plenty of indication that people around the world still value democracy. But it's not quite where we were 30 years ago when Nancy and I were in the Clinton administration. And as she said, when it was looking uh, you know, sunnier and more optimistic, it's, I mean, I would argue not to diminish the accomplishments in any way of the Clinton administration, but it's a little easier to, you know, to uh, work those policies when everything is breaking your way. You know, when people <laughs> believe in the Washington consensus, when more countries are becoming democratic, et cetera. Uh, I think it's much more challenging now when all of these trends are, are in reverse and when people, I think, don't really know how to reverse some of these trends. One of the great services that the Miller Center does is um, uh, get administration officials right when they come out of government and sit them down for days and interview them and ask them very, very well-researched questions. And I did that after the administration, and they're now, 25 years later, starting to come out. <laughs> and I have to say, we thought everything was breaking our way. Um, and I think we missed a lot of uh, risk to democracy, to um, the globalization, the impact of globalization on the issue of um, bad ideas circulating very quickly. You know, these terrorist organizations wouldn't be possible without the internet, et cetera. Um, but I think one of the, the uh, I'd just echo the point Eric made on the income inequality. Um, ponder this statistic. The top eight richest men, they're all men, white men, own more wealth than the bottom four billion people. And they know it. You know, it's great that Jeff Bezos announced yesterday's $10 billion effort to uh, combat climate change, but uh, there's something wrong with this picture when you have that type of dramatic income inequality that people know, and it, 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 it does a certain anger. Um, and secondly, I would just recommend a book by Madeleine Albright that came out last year on fascism, A Warning. Um, and it, it go, points to many of the points that um, Eric just mentioned about the, the rise of this and how you do it. It's a, it's a very powerful uh, book. And as someone who lived in, under the communist threat, you see these signs coming back that I, I frankly find just stunning in the 21st century that we're dealing with some of these same old bugaboos that we saw a century ago. Thank you. It's time. Let's pause and um, first of all, thank our ambassadors. But we're not finished. <laughs> and now we have a few minutes for your questions. And I believe there's, yes, yeah, so right here. And I think a microphone's coming your way. Yes. Yes, you talked about uh, President Trump's uh, relationship with Putin. Do you have any thoughts, rumors, of exactly what went on in those two hours he was with Putin by himself? Uh, I have a personal theory that Putin's worth 
$200 billion, and he basically said, hey, you know, how much do you want to just do what's in my best interest? Comments, thoughts, am I crazy? <laughs> I'm sure it's all in John Bolton's book. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 8. <laughs> no, no takers. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I'll, I, I don't have any idea. Um, I don't think it's your scenario. Um, and I think we may never know. Uh, eventually, maybe someone will interview the translators. But I, I think the interest between um, them, we're talking about the election interference, um, I think Putin, I mean, I think uh, Trump has business interest in, in Moscow, um, talking about how you can, um, you know, trying to keep some of these um, pro-autocratic, you know, dictator-like territories um, going. Um, it, nothing good, or he would have let the um, note-takers in. But I'm <coughs> curious to find out. One of the most, I mean, I think it's, you know, we, we tend to focus too much on the Trump-Putin relationship, which, while troubling and worrisome, I don't mean to suggest it isn't, but uh, by and large, sort of the institutional guardrails have kind of held up in terms of the various departments of the government you know, preventing. We still have sanctions. We still have <laughs> sanctions in They've place. They've gotten tougher. Um, so I, I, I worry less about that. But, but what John Bolton allegedly said behind closed doors to an audience in Florida a couple of months ago um, about the president taking a lot of his actions to uh, essentially feather his own nest in business terms, I find very disturbing. And, uh, it, you know, the, and a lot of it's hiding in plain sight. You know, it's sort of not deep, dark secrets. I mean, what's been going on with Turkey, um, and just recently, this, you know, uh, I think NBC News had a story that uh, Attorney General Barr was pre you know, pressuring the Southern District of New York not to indict Hulk Bank, which is a state-owned bank that was implicated in the largest sanctions evasion effort against Iran in history, way larger than the one that BNP Paribas was involved in, for which we fined them $8 billion. Um, uh, and this was all done at the behest of Erdogan, while the president has ongoing business, you know, in Turkey with his uh, hotel in Istanbul, I, I think is really, really worrisome. One uh, of the things I could see coming out after Trump is a, a law that requires any presidential candidate to release their taxes. I think it's, it's so obviously essential that um, we know. And he can do what he wants, but we need to know about it. Questions? Um, yes, sir. Uh, I'm a visitor from uh, that country that Ambassador Nancy's students don't know where it is. Oh, no. Um, and as long I'm as they know where Ukraine and Bangladesh are, <laughs> they pass the Secretary of State's geography test. Uh, necessarily, we have a slightly different view of the world than, than you do here. Uh, but what my interest to me is what advice you would give to the leaders of the democratic countries who are feeling alienated by the recent American posture? Don't give up. Um, you know, the president needs to hear from uh, the leaders of the world on what they think. They need, I think they, and I think they have been quite frank with him. There's that famous picture of Angela Merkel sitting there, you know, Trump sitting at a desk and she's like this and he's like, you know, forget it. Um, don't, don't quit, don't give up. Uh, there are powers in numbers. I'd work beyond the G8. Um, for those of you who don't know these terms, the G7 is basically European countries, us and Canada. Um, G8, we invited Russia to come in in the 90s, was it? Um, 93. Uh, and then, yeah, it was a Clinton decision. And then um, kicked him out after he invaded Ukraine in 2014. But it's the G20, uh, the major country. The, it's the G7 plus the major countries in um, Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Um, and have pushed back um, and just don't stop. And eventually, as I was saying before, the, the center does hold in the end on these things because the center is what um, is fact-driven, reality-driven. Um, you know, it's, it, it eventually does emerge after sort of 
pendulum swings on both sides. So speak truth to power is the most important thing. Um, you know, we, we all have kids in our lives and teenagers in particular, they all say their eyes may be rolling, but their ears are open. And it does eventually, I think, um, emerge that the, the facts and reality have to occur. And um, what Putin is just laughing straight to his goals of disrupting NATO, fomenting authoritarianism, dividing this country. Um, it's his playbook being played out right here, and it's frightening. And I think it requires American people, education, educated people, but also uh, world leaders to continue to stand up to him. And um, it is not going to last forever either. So keep, keep things going so that when there's some um, opening up to, um, you know, Trump's policies right now are driven to please his base. And that is only going to get more intense between now and November. It'll be interesting to see if he does get reelected, whether the, any of that would change, because he doesn't have to get reelected. He may decide he wants to stay in power forever and do something else, but I don't think that that's going to work here. Um, so I would say just keep it up and take care of Meghan and Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Victoria. Eric, Adelman, any, anything to add? Nope. Okay. <laughs> so front row question here. Yeah, mic, the mic is on the way. Thanks. Hi, so thank you very much for being here uh, this morning. My name is John. I'm a fourth year uh, student here at UVA studying foreign affairs and history. Um, undergrad? And I, undergrad, yep. You um, said fourth year here, not senior. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I just want to go back to Russia. I know both of you have mentioned that um, Putin is openly exerting um, influence. Um, in the former Soviet countries. Um, and I wanted to ask about the role of, of NATO um, in confronting that. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, NATO's been, been having issues recently. Uh, the French President Macron um, saying that NATO's brain dead. Um, but then uh, there's, there's also the Def Defender 20 exercises um, and then a recent Pew um, poll uh, that, that is, um, uh, seen support from from NATO member member countries for NATO, um, and so my question is just what what is the future role of NATO in in kind of combating uh, Russian Russian influence um, that's moving towards the West? You know the I mean the um, the classic uh, description of NATO was Lord Ismay's description that it was to keep the Americans in, the Germans down, and the Russians out. Um, and it's still true, I mean, largely. Without the United States in, um, you know, NATO can't function. Um, uh, so when Macron says, you know, NATO is brain dead, what he's really politely saying is, you know, the United States of America is brain dead. Right now, and, and from a political point of view, if you're a European, I can understand why you would think that. Um, right now, NATO has a real challenge because we essentially, uh, we and our European allies, demobilized in Europe uh, after 1993. Um, and that was for good and sufficient reason. People thought that the Soviet threat to Europe had gone away and there was no need to defend Europe militarily anymore. What we really needed to do was take NATO and, you know, make it a, a, a more global agency. You know, Senator Luger uh, famously, you know, promoted NATO enlargement as out of area or out of business. Um, and uh, A, we've realized there are some limits to that from our experience with NATO in Afghanistan. That's not to say we shouldn't try and use NATO for things like that, but we need to have some realistic, I think, uh, understanding of its limitations uh, for that purpose. But moreover, we really need to rediscover the fundamental collective defense purpose of NATO because today, given the fact that the uh, Russians have built up their military capability from what it was back in the 90s, um, we face some you know, very serious uh, challenges in defending Europe. When, when Putin invaded Ukraine, uh, reoccupied Crimea, 
annexed it, and then uh, sponsored the destabilization of the Donbass, eastern Ukraine. There was not a single U.S. tank in Europe. And we, we, the U.S. Army, for instance, had systematically disinvested in, in long-range artillery. And so we find ourselves militarily, you know, in a circumstance where if the Russians were to challenge Article 5 by launching a conventional military aggression against, say, one of the Baltic states, we'd be in very, very difficult circumstances trying to defend them and execute Article 5. I mean, Rand has done a both classified and unclassified study of this, and you know, I, I commend the unclassified version to you. You can find it on the web. But we have some very serious deficiencies we have to repair in order to be able to have a, a serious conventional deterrent. We have our nuclear deterrent, but I don't think you want to rely on you know, a nuclear deterrent solely. Um, so NATO still has an important role to play, um, but the U.S. has to galvanize that role, and it can't happen against a backdrop of constant threats to pull out or hectoring of allies, you know, to, you know, that they haven't met their 2% threshold. I mean, some of that goes on in every administration. Actually, some of that's been going on since the ink was drying on the Washington Treaty in 1949. We constantly have been uh, after our allies to try and, and do more, and we should do that. But it's got to be done in a way that um, doesn't leave the kind of wounds that the president has left um, in his various uh, forays into NATO summitry. I would just um, agree with that. I'm going to do something a little unconventional here, if you'll let me. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I, you might look at as a student is, were we right not to expand NATO to include Georgia and Ukraine? Because Russia hasn't touched anyone else who is in there. And there are, what, 28 members maybe? Had we 29, done yeah. 29? And then you know, had there been a few more. But I, I would like to just um, make a comment that I do in my classes. Uh, not one woman answered, asked a question. And I will not leave this audience without at least taking one question from one woman. Well, Women always have great questions, and you're too you afraid can, to. You can blame me. <laughs> I, I made that have um, hands. How about right here? What do you think is going to happen with the Philippines uh, when they announce they wanted us to leave? Do you think we will? Good Very good. That was on my list. Thank you. <laughs> I don't think we will. Um, I think they'll realize they need us, particularly with the rise of China. But Eric might have a different. Um, well, you know, it's interesting. <coughs> he, uh, President Duterte asked that, you know, he wants to undo the um, status of forces agreement that allows the military to be there. But he didn't say he wanted to renounce the treaty. Uh, we're bound by, uh, you know, a treaty to defend the Philippines. It's got an Article 5 in it, just as the Mutual Security Treaty with Japan does and the, the NATO Treaty does. And I noted, interestingly, that, you know, he, he's taking an action that doesn't actually, you know, eliminate the, um, the treaty requirement. And, you know, we might want to raise that with him because I'm not sure he understands that there's a relationship between the two things. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure I agree with Nancy. I mean, in the past, when we've been asked to leave, for instance, uh, when we were asked to leave uh, Clark, you know, uh, Air Force Base uh, and our naval base in the Philippines uh, in the early 1990s, we left. And as a rule, when, you know, we're asked to leave, we do in the United States, which is one of the things that distinguishes us from other nations you know, are, are around the world. Um, we've got a similar issue brewing, of course, with Iraq in the wake of the Soleimani, um, the Soleimani strike, although I take those requests actually less seriously than I do Duterte's request, because that was done without the Sunni or Kurdish representatives in the um, Council of Representatives in Iraq being present. Uh, and I think if you get all of them in there, you're going to get a different kind of parliamentary discussion going. Um, but I think there's a reasonable chance, you know, we will, you know, our limited presence in the Philippines will come to an end, which will make the question of defending the Philippines in any kind of uh, confrontation with China a little bit more sporty. I mean, in the long run, I think the logic of Nancy's position, which is they ought to be concerned about the rise of China 
uh, particularly since some of the South China Sea issues directly right impact yeah. the Philippines. But I mean, you know, sometimes people don't act in their own best interest. And with that, we are out of time. So I want to thank you. Yeah. I, I want to thank. Um, Thank, I want to thank Nancy Soderberg, Eric Edelman for the sober insight and analysis. I really want to thank them for their ongoing work as well, being here and what they do uh, thank you the all rest very of their careers. So thank you. Thank yeah. you all. It was great conversation.